Uh, if you're new with us, we just want to say welcome. So glad that you're here. My name's Pete. I have the honor of serving beside my bride, Kelly, who was just on stage with me uh, to lead this incredible group of people that uh, are called Life Church Buffalo, that God has been doing a very special work here. And uh, uh, we are in week number two of a series we started last week uh, called The Kingdom. And um, if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to go ahead and grab those and turn to Revelation chapter 21. Uh, we are going to be there in just a few moments. And while you're turning there, kind of let me give you an update and recap of what we covered last week. Uh, we said that um, really from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation, the kingdom of God is one of the main themes, if not the main theme, in the overarching story of Scripture. And it was the main theme of all of Jesus' teachings when he walked this earth as well. Last week, I also gave you uh, Matt Chandler's definition or description of the kingdom using those three D words. We're going to continue to use that language throughout the series. I think it really helps us wrap our heads around the different aspects of what is involved in the kingdom. And the first word was dwelling, that God in the beginning created a space in which his unhindered, unfettered presence could dwell with God's people, that our souls were designed and created for that that God with us is the overarching story of scripture, that the kingdom of God is about the presence of God dwelling with the people of God. But then we also talked about dominion, that in Genesis 1, we see God give what's called the cultural mandate to fill the earth and subdue it, to take dominion and exercise God's dominion as image bearers and viceroys over creation. That you and I have, just like Adam and Eve in the garden and like the disciples at the Mount of Ascension, been tasked by God to expand his kingdom, to bring order to chaos and light to darkness. But then we also talked about the kingdom being a dynasty, that you and I have been invited, adopted, and grafted into this eternal dynasty of King Jesus as a royal priesthood that will one day rule and reign with King Jesus forever. This is a very condensed and somewhat oversimplified way to define and describe this broad, complex topic of the kingdom of God. That in Genesis 1, God created and established the kingdom until sin enters the picture in Genesis 3, and the kingdom kind of descends into chaos. Our dominion is misused and abused, which leads to corruption and violence and death. And so Jesus then shows up announcing the good news that he was sent to proclaim that the kingdom of God had come near. But not only that, we see this promise repeated throughout the scripture, both Old and New Testaments, that the kingdom of God was going to one day be remade and reestablished. We also talked last week about how one of the reasons we have such a hard time understanding the kingdom is because of the sometimes confusing language that surrounds it when we read about it in scripture. There's this element of it being here and there, it being now and then, it being inside of us, but also outside of us. And so what I want to do today is look at the aspects of the kingdom that are not so much about the here and now and in us, but look at the aspects of the kingdom that will be here soon. And I say soon because Jesus said it's coming soon. And if he said it soon, I can say it soon. Now, the problem for us is that we have no idea what soon means to a God that stands outside of space and time. It's been coming soon for 2000 years. So I want us to kind of lift our eyes at what's coming, and I want to frame that around hope. And here's why, because what you place your hope in is directly tied to your experience of joy. If you put your ultimate hope into things that cannot bear up under the weight of that hope, then you will ultimately experience a whole lot of anxiety and anger, which will lead to you controlling and manipulating people and things which ultimately is not good for human relationships. Anxiety and anger leading to control and manipulation, how many of you know is not a recipe for the good life, for deep relationships, for soul-satisfying experiences? No, it, it is what is the cause of, of so much destruction and heartbreak and conflict. If you place your hope into things that cannot bear the weight of them, you will ultimately, the chances that you will experience anxiety and anger leading to control and manipulation is really, really high. Let me give you just a few examples of where we see that playing out, where we have kind of misplaced our hope. And the first is in marriage. 
A lot of people, singles sometimes, have this idea or this thought that's perpetuated by culture that if I could only get married, if I could only find Mr. or Mrs. Right, then I'll be happy, then I'll be fulfilled, then I'll find my purpose. You're putting a lot of hope in some perfect person to come in and kind of Jerry Maguire your life and, and complete you. Can I just tell you that they won't? They won't. Married people don't agree with me too much on this. In a lot of ways, you get married and that person will make a lot of things in your life more difficult. They were never meant to complete you. Only one can. His name is Jesus. And if you're single and you put your hope here, you will paralyze yourself. And listen, God is not waiting for you to be married to call you into something significant. We've got to fight against this lie. You do not have to wait for some person to come in and complete you for you to step into God's call and will and purpose for your life. And if you are married and you've kind of bet your life on marriage being the thing that's gonna help you make some sense of your life, you're likely already beginning to feel the weight of disappointment that may be leading to some anxiety and anger and leading to control and manipulation. This is a place where I think we get this wrong in the church sometimes. Listen, don't get me wrong. Marriage is a good and beautiful thing from God. Like the Bible says, he who finds a wife finds what is good, right? And I've certainly experienced that to be true in my own life. Scripture says that marriage should be honored by all. But I would add this, honored but not idolized. And I think in the church, especially here in the West, we have idolized marriage in the church and have made it the goal and pinnacle of the Christian life that everyone is supposed to aspire to. Not everyone is supposed to be married, Marriage is one of the things that's created by God to help us fill the earth and subdue it. And for those who are called to it, marriage is a tool that God uses to make us holy more than he does to make us happy as our spouse is supposed to be a person that helps us fulfill our kingdom calling and assignment. But singleness is not a lesser call than marriage. Jesus and the apostle Paul were single. Some could argue that singleness is actually a greater call than marriage because it allows you, it enables you to live a life of undivided devotion to Jesus. If you're married, you're divided. You've got to give some of your attention and time to caring for and providing for your spouse and, and doing all of that, whereas the single person doesn't have to. They can just be all in on Jesus. So marriage, as awesome and as beautiful as it can be, is one of the places that we misplace our hope. Another place that we do that is with our kids. Listen, children are a blessing from the Lord. Scripture says that being a dad is one of the highest callings of my life. But a lot of people see their kids as the ultimate hope for their meaning, their purpose, and their reward in this life. Kids can be one of the ways that we bring kingdom influence to bear in the world that we live in. But listen, y'all, kids make terrible gods, they're wild. We were never meant to put our ultimate hope in having kids or in having good kids. Don't hear me wrong. Wanting kids is a good and right desire. It's just a terrible ultimate hope. Third place that we misplace our hope is in our work. Tell me that we don't, in our culture, place our hope for fulfillment in work. Oh, if I could just get to this level of the organization, if I could just get to this position, if I could just make this much money, then I'll be happy, then I'll be somebody. Terrible place to misplace our hope. And a fourth thing that we misplace our hope in is in politics. And specifically in the person who occupies the Oval Office. Listen, y'all, with the election just a couple weeks away, many Christians are shouting that the only hope for America is if the right candidate gets in office, and they are losing their minds with anxiety at the fear that the wrong person might get in. And listen, this happens on both sides of the aisle, where one candidate is viewed as the devil while the other achieves some messianic-type status as being the person who will defeat evil on the other side. Republicans are so horrified at the evils on the left that they have invested tremendous hope in the admittedly morally bankrupt Donald Trump to defeat the left. And on the other side, listen, it goes both ways. Democrats are so horrified at the person of Trump and all who would vote for him that they invest their hope in Kamala Harris to defeat the evil on the right. 
If Harris is the devil, then Trump becomes some kind of messiah. And vice versa, if Trump is the antichrist, then Harris becomes some kind of Christ figure. But both perspectives dilute our hope in King Jesus. Throughout the New Testament, listen, throughout the New Testament, the proclamation that Jesus is Lord meant that Caesar was not. And Caesar in their culture was deified. He saw himself as a God and they expected all of the citizens of Rome to treat to and refer to Caesar as being a God. And so when we say Jesus is Lord, we're saying that Caesar is not. The president is not. Our allegiance is to King Jesus first as citizens of heaven. So when we put our hope and faith in him and we follow him, it should overshadow any kind of a hope that we put in broken people occupying some office in Washington into some position of power. Now listen, that doesn't mean that some, um, I'm gonna use the word Babylonian leaders aren't better than others at managing Babylon. We just have to remind ourselves that they're managing Babylon. And we can't expect to change Babylon using Babylonian systems and Babylonian power. We are citizens of a different kingdom and our allegiance is to King Jesus. It also does not mean, please don't hear me wrong, I'm not saying that we shouldn't care about the issues and that we shouldn't care about the injustices around us. It just means that our civic, um, our civic involvement should be an extension of our allegiance to King Jesus, not a distraction from it. Because Jesus believed that true justice and righteousness would be established through a different upside down kingdom that he came to announce the arrival of and that we are supposed to be the embodiment of. If you have placed your hope in a president rather than in the prince of peace who is the sovereign king and ruler of the universe, then you have made an idol out of politics and you have misplaced your hope. Listen, I can cut the tension with a knife in here. We are going to, I am going to attempt to tackle more of politics in the coming weeks as we lead up to the election. And I'm asking for your grace and I'm specifically asking for your prayers because if I am being honest with you, I'm dreading it because I'm sick and tired of the division that happens in the body of Christ over some Babylonian leader that sits in office when we serve the king of kings who said that the hope for this world is in his citizens expanding the kingdom to the ends of the earth. The fastest growing church in the world right now is in Iran. So don't tell me we need some perfect person sitting in the office for us to flourish and thrive and grow the kingdom of God. Some of y'all come in here pre-armed with all of your ammunition of what you think I should be talking about from the stage. But guess what? I fear God more than I fear you. So I'm gonna preach the gospel and you can take it or leave it. It's gonna get spicy in here. So marriage, kids, work, and politics are just a handful of the things that we have misplaced our hope in. And by the way, most of us live this way. In the church, as Christians, we're not exempt from this. We're just moving so fast. We're so busy that we don't even have time to take a breath to say, oh my gosh, that's why I'm so frustrated in my marriage. That's why I'm so frustrated with my kids. That's why I'm so frustrated in my singleness. That's why I'm so angry at work all the time. That's why I'm so anxious about this upcoming election. Because you've placed your hope on things that can't bear the weight of your hope. And again, some of these things like marriage and kids are good gifts from a good God who's a good father. But they are not where we, where we place our ultimate hope. Our ultimate hope is in the kingdom here and the kingdom there. Now, when I talk about the kingdom there, I'm not simply talking about some disembodied experience floating on a cloud playing a harp while we sing for all of eternity. The question in Jesus' day and age of what must I do to inherit eternal life would never have been interpreted of how do I get to heaven? That would have been a foreign concept to first century Jewish believers. When you read in the New Testament questions or discussions or verses that are about the future or the afterlife, it was always within the framework of the coming age. 
They weren't asking, how do I get to heaven? They were asking, how do I get to the coming age where the world has been liberated from sin and death and the enemies of God? How do I get there? God help us. Like most modern evangelicals have zero clue for what the Bible talks about when it comes to eschatology. And again, I shared with you last week, eschatology is simply the theology of end times, the doctrine of things to come, the future kingdom. And for us, our explanation of the gospel has been reduced to personal conversion, not a remade heaven and earth. We describe the gospel this way. Jesus died to save me from my sins and I will stand before him one day and because I've placed my trust in him, he will grant me heaven. But if you deny him, he'll deny you and he'll give you hell. That's the good news of the gospel. Won't you come to heaven? Now again, that's not entirely inaccurate or incorrect, but it is grossly incomplete. That is not how the Bible talks about your future or my future. Sure, is there a heaven? Yeah, absolutely. Will there be a time, temporarily at least, where we will be disembodied spirits in the presence of God? I believe so, from the time we die until the time he returns. I think that's what the Bible depicts. But when all is said and done, is that our ultimate hope? No, no, it's not. So what will our future look like? What will this coming kingdom be like? That's what I want to spend the rest of our time together today kind of unpacking. Let me give you my outline. We're going to talk about a remade cosmos, remade bodies, and a remade reality. So there you go. Let's, let's do this. Let's start with number one. There will be a remade cosmos in the remade kingdom. I want to start with looking at what the apostle John wrote when he had his vision of the remade kingdom in Revelation chapter 21, verses one through seven, where he writes, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. I cannot wait for that. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this and I will be their God and they will be my children. What you're seeing here is the cosmos, the heavens, the earth, the expanse of the universe remade as the kingdom in all of its fullness. And what we see in this picture is a far cry from the world we live in right now. The world we live in right now doesn't look anything like this. The cosmos we are in now is a Genesis 3 cosmos where sin is affecting everything. In our reality, it's broken and busted. There's a lot of death. There's a lot of crying. There's a lot of mourning. There's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of loss. It's the world we inhabit and it's a world that the Bible is honest about when it comes to our experiences in it. The Apostle Paul tries to help us see this when he um, talks about creation this way in Romans chapter 8, verse 19. He says, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in order that creation itself would be liberated from its bondage to decay, to, to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. It's not until verse 23 that he even brings up humankind. So he's talking about the creative order here. He's talking about mountains and trees and wolves and whales. 
He's talking about creation that's been subjected to frustration. Another translation says to futility, that it's broken and groaning. He's basically saying, look, the world as it is now is not the way it was designed to be, nor the way that it will be. And somehow creation knows it and it's groaning. It aches. It wants to be set free. And it knows that its freedom is wrapped up in the children of God. So it watches the children of God with eager expectation that it will too also one day be set free. This is what Augustine meant when he looked out at creation and he said, if these are the beauties afforded to sinful men, what does God have in store for those who love him? I don't know if you've been able to travel or what, kind of the, what parts of the world you've been able to see, but have you ever looked at anything in creation that was so beautiful it made your soul ache? I got to experience a small taste of this just a few months ago on our Alaskan cruise as we're standing on the deck of our cruise ship and looking out at the Hubbard Glacier. I showed you a picture of it the week we got back from sabbatical and I was just this emotion evoked out of me as I wept at the beauty and the majesty of our creation. But what I saw is not what it was and it's not what it shall be. Every time you look at beauty and creation, you should be reminded of the fact every time you see a sunset and you see the sky painted with yellow and and turquoise and pink and orange and, and your soul aches at the beauty of it, just be reminded that it's not what it was and it's not what it shall be. Creation is longing to be set free and to be remade. And it's not just in Revelation that we see this. Since the fall, God has been encouraging us, encouraging his people with this promise that the kingdom is going to be remade, that the fullness of the kingdom will be known, that it's here, but that it's also coming. The prophet Isaiah explains it this way in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 through 9. It says, the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf, the young lion, and the fattened calf will be together, and a child will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze. Their young ones will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like cattle. An infant will play beside the cobra's pit. And a toddler will put his hand into a snake's den. They will not harm or destroy each other on my entire holy mountain. For the land will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the sea is filled with water. I love in verse 6 how he even adds the fattened calf in there. He already talked about the calf and the lion, but then he adds the fattened calf. It's like the lion will lie down with the steak and the steak will not be afraid for its life. Like what is, what is he doing there? If the calf is already mentioned, but he, he's basically saying, look, even the most succulent temptation that a lion could ever want will be there and he won't even be tempted for it because it will be as it's supposed to be. The kingdom remade. Do you see what we have coming? It's not disembodied and it's not in the clouds. It's not some ethereal spiritual experience. It's children on the ground playing in the dirt with cobras. And the cobras won't have their mouths glued shut. They'll be there. They're just not going to strike. This is what was meant to be. This is what is coming when all things are remade. And this is what Christ's blood has purchased. Thomas Rouse says it like this. He says, the coming of God's kingdom in its fullness, the triumph of God's justice that would vindicate all those who suffered injustice or persecution, binding up their wounds, wiping the tears from their eyes, and raising them to life eternal with Christ. All creation will join in this celebration, participating in Christ's victory over sin and death. There will be a new heaven and a new earth set free from corruption and slavery, subject finally to God, who would be all in all. It's a remade cosmos. It's not you floating on a cloud, playing a harp and singing. It's all things remade. That's the remade cosmos. Number two, we will have remade bodies in the remade kingdom. Listen, this body that you and I live in right now is wholly inadequate for this event. And the good news is that what we are wearing, this is not what we're going to be wearing for this affair. Because this has a different purpose, which the Apostle Paul talks about and writes about in 1 Corinthians 15. This is a remade body for the remade cosmos. Look at verse 35. But someone may ask, how will the dead be raised? And what kind of bodies will they have? What a foolish question. Now, I just got to be honest with you. I think Paul's being a little bit harsh here. Like, I don't know if he's having a bad day or what, but like, these are good questions. 
I have these questions. Many of you have these questions. Like, when we're resurrected, what's it going to be like? Like, will we come back in our prime, or are we going to look entirely different? Am I going to be resurrected as a 24-year-old or as a 44-year-old? Like, what kind of body will we have? Like, what's it going to be like? I think that's a great question. And Paul responds to that question like, what a foolish question. Whatever, Paul. (laughs) He goes on to say, when you put a seed into the ground, it doesn't grow into a plant unless it dies first. And what you put in the ground is not the plant that will grow, but only a bare seed of wheat or whatever you're planting. Then God gives it the new body he wants it to have. A different plant grows from each kind of seed. Verse 42, it's the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they'll be raised in glory. They're buried in weakness, but they'll be raised in strength. They're buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. Skip down to verse 50. What I am saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die but we will all be transformed. It'll happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever, and we who are living will also be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Now, a couple things about this passage. First, the body that we have right now, this physical body is perishable and it will be planted in the ground like a seed. We have been built for a fallen world at this point. Like my skin, your skin keeps out viruses and bad bacteria. My liver needs to filter out toxins from my blood. I have adrenaline for fight or flight. I have all sorts of responses and defense mechanisms that are built into me to keep me alive in a fallen world that I will not need in glory. So much of our physical body right now is meant to keep us alive in a Genesis 3 world. But in the kingdom to come, in the new heavens and the new earth, we will not need that energy that we use to defend ourselves here because there it'll be given over to praising God and ruling alongside King Jesus forever. So this thing has to go into the ground because this thing is perishable. Now he doesn't give us a whole lot of details, but what he does say is that what is race will be imperishable. It will never die, which means there'll be no more cricks in the neck in glory. No more bad backs and bad knees in glory. It'll be imperishable. And to that I say, the older I get, yes, Lord Jesus, please. I cannot wait for that. When this happens, when we get our imperishable bodies, it says death will be mocked. And what a great day will that be. Where, oh, death is your victory. Where is your sting? When we get to stand over death and say, what you got now? What you gonna take from me now? I got an imperishable body. You got nothing. Where's your victory, oh death? Where's your sting? What will that look like? I don't exactly know. But in the gospels, we can read that the disciples, that after Jesus was resurrected, he invited the disciples to touch the wounds in his hands and stick their hands in his side so there was matter to it. We know that Jesus ate real food with his resurrected body. He appeared places, which I'm kind of really excited about in the coming kingdom. Like, that'll be pretty cool. Like, what we get to do with our resurrected bodies is not specifically laid out for us. It's all conjecture at this point, but here's what I can see. Whatever you imagine it to be, it'll be better. Some of y'all are like, man, I really hope we get to fly in the kingdom. Awesome. Like, whatever you think it is, it's gonna be better than that. Some of you are like, I think, I hope I get to, whatever it is, I I think God looks down at us and like, like a kid coloring a picture. It's like, oh, isn't that cute? That's so nice. Like whatever you imagine it to be, it's going to be better than that. 
So the kingdom to come will have a remade cosmos and we will have remade bodies. The third point is that there will be a remade reality in the remade kingdom. Which Isaiah points to in Isaiah chapters 64, 65, and 66, which are all about this this remade kingdom, the new heavens and the new earth. But I'm just going to read a few verses from chapter 65, where God, who's speaking through Isaiah, says this. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought of as a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them and, or, or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will the days of my people be. My chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain, nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together and the lion will eat straw like the ox and dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. This is a picture of what's to come when the kingdom is visible in all of its fullness. And while I'm not going to pretend like I understand everything that's recorded in this prophecy, I do want to highlight just a couple of things. And the first one is that it says the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. Now, scholars are kind of split over exactly what this means. Are we not going to have any memory at all of our original life here in this fallen kingdom? I don't really know. I can tell you what I think it means. And let me be clear, this is my opinion This is not a statement of truth or doctrine, so you can take this or leave it. I don't know that I necessarily believe that it means we won't remember the former things. We won't remember hard or difficult things that we walked through here as much as we'll be able to see it the way the Lord saw it. There's been some things in my life, some hard and difficult things that I've walked through that I can look back on now with gratitude and joy knowing what God was able to do in me and through me because of it. And so I think when that day comes... I think that we'll be able to, like there's a whole lot of mystery to this. I don't understand all of it. There's been some things like some gut-wrenching, heartbreaking, what in the world are you doing God moments in my life that when that day comes, I think I'll be able to look back on and realize that Jesus pulled me into his presence because of that trial, that tribulation, that suffering, and he accomplished his purposes in me through it, and I'll be able to see it the way he saw it. That's just my opinion. I don't know if that's actually what it means. But I just think that if, if we could see things that happen in our lives, the, the hard and difficult things, the way Jesus sees them, unlike the times now where we're in the middle of this broken and fallen world and, and we're sometimes blinded to what in the world God could possibly be doing in this hardship, I just think it'll be different in the kingdom to come where we'll have eyes to see the way he saw He also says here that there's no more weeping or distress, which is awesome because it means there's nothing to worry or be anxious about. Anxiety and worry are not a part of the coming kingdom. How much of our energy today goes into being anxious and worrying about tomorrow? How much of our joy today is robbed because we spend so much time worrying about tomorrow? In the kingdom rebate, there'll be nothing to be worried about. There'll be nothing to be anxious about. Listen, I have a wife, three kids, a church I'm trying to lead. Y'all think I don't worry about stuff? Every day I'm bringing, dragging stuff into the presence of God saying, I don't know what to do about this. I'm worried about this. Will you work in her life? Will you work in his life? God, I don't know what decision to make in the church about this situation. God, will you lead me? I'm dragging all of these, these hard, bad compulsions that I have into the presence of Jesus, asking for grace and peace and hope in it. You and I live in a fallen world where we're living in this tension, where we're constantly wrestling 
with these things, dragging them into the presence of Jesus, but in the kingdom remade, that wrestle won't even exist anymore. And isn't that good news? Listen, I don't know how your walk with Jesus is going, but in my walk with Jesus, I am constantly dragging fear and worry and anxiety and bad compulsions into the presence of Jesus and asking him to grow me and mature me and give me strength to face it and go through it. I thought I'd be farther along 40 years into following Jesus than I am right now. And it's not a bad or evil thing to wrestle with compulsions. It's actually a mature and godly thing to drag those compulsions into the presence of Christ by the grace of God. But in the kingdom to come, there won't even be a wrestle. The compulsions will be gone, whatever they are. Do you have a compulsion towards anger? Do you have a compulsion towards lust? Do you have a compulsion towards selfishness? A compulsion towards worry? Whatever it is, it's gone. Prone to depression, it's just gone. You won't have to fight it anymore. It won't be there. And that alone makes me go even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I long for that day. He also says, and this is important, that there are real homes and there's gonna be feasting going on. Amen, the food lovers in the room said amen. (laughs) We need to get this. What we have traditionally called heaven, that the Bible calls the kingdom, is not ethereal. You won't be flying around in the clouds. We'll be in houses. We'll feast together in the same way that Jesus' resurrected body ate real fish. We'll be embodied creatures in a new heaven and earth with new bodies that'll never die in and dwelling in his presence, that if we were to experience even a taste of that right now, it would blow all our circuits. Lastly, I want to point out that he says we will work without toil. Some of y'all have a wrong view of heaven, the kingdom of God. Like you think it's an eternal um, retirement where you just get to kick your legs up and do nothing for all of eternity. No, we're going to work without toil. We're going to enjoy the fruit of our labor. We're going to rule and reign alongside King Jesus. So again, this idea of playing a harp and singing songs is just silly. It's not true. It comes from this escapism mentality that has us jettisoning this world while this one gets blown up into nothing. And I just don't believe that's what the Bible teaches. I don't. I believe it teaches that this world will be remade and purified. And we will be on it, living in homes, working without toil, feasting, joy, life in his presence forevermore. Dwelling and dominion remain while we are in our dynasty. This is the kingdom remade. So let me just lay this before you, church. The Christian life, in my opinion, is one where we are supposed to live towards that day with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. I want to, and the Bible calls you and me to live towards this day. I'm not living towards the day when I get to retire. I'm not living towards the day when I get to be an empty nester. I'm not living towards the day when I have grandbabies. I'm not living towards the day when you fill in the blank. I'm living towards this day. The kingdom remained, and every day I'm closer to it. And this roots me in a kind of discipleship that enables me to not lose heart when my compulsions feel like I'll never beat them. Because I will, and you will. It doesn't matter what they are. This is what's coming for us. So let's turn our face towards it, and let's not forget about it. Because the days can be difficult. Life can be hard. Loss is real. We're living in a Genesis 3 world yet filled with the Holy Spirit, experiencing the kingdom now, breaking through in power, sustaining us until the day when we get to see this kingdom remade with our resurrected eyes. We won't need contacts or glasses to see it in that reality. Just know that as each day passes, we are closer to the kingdom being remade. It's not a fairy tale. Jesus said, write these words down for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. It will happen. And so I want to wrap all of my life and my behavior around this reality. 
Am I loving my wife? Am I loving my children? Am I loving my neighbor? Am I living in this space in such a way that shows that this is the kingdom I'm betting my life on? This is where I've placed my hope. Because if this is where I place my hope, then any difficulty I have is put into its proper perspective. I'm trying to fill you with hope right now and say that there is a day coming when you will stand over your struggle and you say, death, where is your victory? And victory will be yours because of Jesus. That's coming. And if you put your hope in anything else in this world, you will constantly be feeling anxious and angry, which will lead you to try and control and manipulate situations and people. which will rob you of the beauty of the kingdom. Not just there, but here. If you're struggling with compulsions, hang in there. Don't hide. Be known. One of the things we often say here is we want this to be a place where it's okay to not be okay. And we want you to feel that. Why? Because we live in a Genesis 3 world. Of course you have compulsions. Are you struggling with lust? Of course you are. Look at the culture we live in. It's no wonder everyone isn't struggling with lust. It's okay. Let's come together. Let's encourage one another, love one another, pray for one another, and drag that compulsion into the presence of Jesus. Do you struggle with same-sex attraction? Do you have gender dysphoria? Okay, come into the light. Be known. Let's wrestle well together while we hold fast to one another, expecting a breakthrough of the kingdom in power in the here and now while we wait for the kingdom to be remade. Are you haunted by depression? Paralyzed by anxiety? Do you wrestle with with mental illness? Don't give up. Tell somebody, get help. We are closer. You will soon stand over depression and mock it and say, what are you going to do now, death? I've got a resurrected body and I will live forever in the presence of Jesus with ultimate peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's coming. I can't wait for it. Where have you placed your hope? Is it in this present reality or is it in the coming kingdom? Do you even know where you've placed your hope? We live in a culture that's moving so fast that the quiet that's needed for us to even honestly evaluate why we're so anxious and angry all the time isn't there. We can't properly diagnose ourselves to say like, I pray that God's Holy Spirit would kind of slow us down to help us realize, oh, that's why I'm so frustrated in my marriage. That's why I'm so frustrated with my kids. That's why I'm so controlling and manipulative. It's because I've placed my hope in things in this world, which were never meant to be able to bear the weight of my hope. If you've put your hope in something that cannot bear the weight of your expectations all you'll experience is anxiety and anger leading to control and manipulation but your king wants so much more for you than that life in the kingdom is full of joy and peace in the Holy Ghost and so just like we did last week I mentioned to you that we want to take communion as a church family every week of the series to kind of root us in the reality of the kingdom that we are a part of. And so if you received one of these on your way in, go ahead and grab that right now. If you did not receive a communion cup when you walked in, go ahead and raise your hand right now and leave it up until one of our ushers finds you and hands you a communion cup. Jesus told us that we are to take communion in remembrance of him and It's not just remembering the things that he said or the things that he did to give us access to this kingdom. It's also remembering all of the things he said, which include the things he said about the kingdom. And the apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, 26 says that whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Communion is meant to not only make us grateful for the price that Jesus paid to give us access into this kingdom, but it also roots our hopes in the coming kingdom where all things are going to be remade. And so, why don't you go ahead and peel back the cellophane seal and hold the bread in your hands as we get ready to do what 
Jesus' disciples have been doing for 2,000 years. The night be- before Jesus was crucified, the night he was betrayed, scripture tells us he took bread and he broke it and he passed it along to his disciples and he says, this bread is my body which is broken for you as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. And so God, we just pause for a moment as a community, as a family, to say thank you for allowing your body to be beaten, broken, nailed to a tree so that we could have wholeness, forgiveness, freedom and victory. God, for all of eternity, we're gonna see the holes in your hands and feet, the nail pierced side as a reminder of the king who did not assume power the way the kings of this world do. He assumed power through an act of sacrificial love and laying down his life. And may we as your people demonstrate your kingdom in the way that we live by loving our enemies, serving one another, Jesus, thank you for the bread, for your body. Amen. Let's eat the bread. Thank you, Lord. Now go ahead and peel back the foil layer. You know, Matthew's gospel tells us that when Jesus took the cup, he said, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine again until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So when we take communion, it's a reminder that there is a day coming when we're gonna hold a glass of wine around a table that's gonna seat all the saints of history and ages gone by, and we're gonna drink with Jesus the kingdom that has been made new. So Father, as we hold this cup in our hands, symbolic of the blood that you spilled on Calvary's tree, Lord, we remember the sacrifice and we say thank you for the forgiveness that it purchased for us. But Lord, we also look forward with great faith and excitement to the day when you will drink it anew with us in your Father's kingdom. Where the cosmos have been remade, our bodies have been remade, reality has been remade. And we'll get to enjoy your presence forevermore. Thank you for the blood. In Jesus' name, let's drink. Now, Heavenly Father, I just pray you seal this moment in our hearts. I pray that you would continue to lead us into all truth, that your Holy Spirit would teach us about this kingdom that is here now, but is also coming, and that we would live our lives in such a way. Lord, that it honors the sacrifice you made. It embodies the principles and values that your kingdom are all about. And may it change the world around us. May we see the gates of darkness push back as the kingdom of God continues to expand and grow through the way that we, as citizens of this kingdom, live our lives. May it be so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I love you, church.